this song. I pray that that's the prayer of your heart this morning. That God will always lead you in the way that He wants you to go. In a better way. Amen. Thank you, Brother Matt. Thank you, Worship Team. So this morning, I want to do what we've been doing the last few weeks and kind of make this a normal routine for us, unless the Lord makes a change here. And then it's just to spend a few moments in prayer together as a church family silently. And I'll just prompt you with some thoughts. There's a lot going on in our world, a lot of things that we have to pray about, and we need to be concerned about the craziness of this world, so I am as well. It just seems like we can't pick up the paper or listen to the news reports at all without hearing some kind of horrific tragedy. We really need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for first responders, pray for our police, pray for our authorities, and all the above. And so uh, let's just do that this morning. And, uh, just give you a thought and pray to the Lord as you see fit. And then um, we'll continue along with just these few thoughts. So let's all pray for the next time. Let's just start out by praying just for a few seconds here for teachers, people who work in the, the school systems. There's a lot of uh, issues there with safety and just a lot of anxiety among people. So let's pray for, for those folks, all those who work in our educational system. as it sounds in the midst of it all, that we would be people with thankful hearts. God has commanded us to be thankful. Maybe we would put him first in all things. as we lift up our thoughts briefly to you this morning. And we know that you've called us to be people of prayer. And so we count as a privilege this morning to do just that. As we consider a vital part of our worship life, our worship lives, and we will be people of prayer. So thank you for hearing these things, Father. And thank you for the struggles in our lives, the things that cause us to be focused on you. Thank you, Lord, that you are a God of holiness and that you are a God who cares about the details of our lives. And so we lift you up this morning and honor you. Our songs have been praise to you from our hearts. And so we ask that you would glorify yourself and magnify yourself as we come before you today. And we realize that we're broken and we need your great grace in our lives. So again, we come with thankful hearts this morning, not understanding everything that occurs around us, but we know that you are God and you understand everything perfectly. And we long for the day that you return to make all things right. Lord, may we love one another as we're supposed to love. May we love our neighbors and our community. Lord, may we be the example of God in this. We pray that we ask all of this in Jesus' name. All right, well, it's so good to see you all this morning, and it's just a joy to be with each other. And so uh, let's stand, and we're going to look at the word of the Lord in Matthew chapter 3.
beginning of verse 7, I want to read verses 7 and 8, and then I want to read all the way down to verse 15, and we'll see how far we get today in this study. But when he, that's John the Baptist, saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And uh, of course today this is what we did not get last time. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father, for I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees, therefore every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Answering said to him, Permit it this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he permitted him. All right, praise the Lord. Let's be seated and let's work. So now, the title of the message today is The Baptism of Jesus, but we need to go back and we didn't finish uh, some things from last time. To the end, as always, we'll just see how far we get today. So let's just think about the narrative for just a minute and what's been happening. John, you'll remember from last time, is dealing with these two groups of people. He lumps into one, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These were the liberals and the legalists we discussed last time. The Pharisees were the people who were the religious righteous, who parade themselves as the only righteous people that really were around. Those were the kind of the head honchos in their minds holding to the letter of the law specifically and supposedly exactly, but really living very hypocritical lives in their daily life. And we talked a lot about them. The Sadducees were the kind of the anything goes people, uh, really held on to nothing specific scripturally, uh, the, at least the cardinal doctrines. Uh, they were the ones who said there is no resurrection of the body, there's no such thing as angels. Uh, doctrine or true teaching, healthy teaching, is not really what's important. What's really more important is kind of what you make it to be, who you want God to be. They were certainly believers in God, but truthfully, they were more concerned with making money. And I guess if I had to lump both of these groups together, I would say that they were people who really wanted one thing, and that was power, or to be noticed by everybody else, and uh, to make a name for themselves. I guess, to be admired or praised by the people. That was really their focus, and we talked a lot about that last time. And so if you missed that, you can go back on the website and, and look at that uh, and listen to that. So when John now sees these people coming for baptism, he knows all of this, and so he says to them, who is it that warned you about the wrath to come? Very clear statement, a great and strong indictment. Basically saying, listen, if you want to be a part of the kingdom of God, here's what has to happen. Now, he was talking to these religious folks. He says, you need to repent. You need to convert. You need to turn around, not just in your actions, but you need to turn around in your heart. Your mind has to change. And you need to not just do that inwardly, but you need to show that that's really what's happened. And that's why John uses this statement about living with fruit under repentance. In other words, truly show me that you've changed. Show the world that you've changed, that you're truly in it for God, and that your heart is really sold out for Him. And then he says here, picking up in our verse today, verse 9, and by the way, don't suppose that you can just say, oh well, Abraham is our father, and that makes everything okay. If you look at verse 9. Interesting statement he adds to that, for I say to you that from these very stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Now, the Jews believed, or at least many of the Jews believed, that just because they were of the bloodline, so to speak, of Abraham, that they had a free ticket into heaven. But they were the golden children, just simply because of their genealogy. I mean, after all, 
Abraham was the father of the nation. They knew that. It had been greatly taught throughout all of Jewish history and teaching. They knew that God had blessed Abraham in an incredible way. So they were the special folks. They knew that God had given to them the covenant promise of being the chosen people of the world to cause others to know him. They were given land. They were given many descendants. And you know all of that from the Old Testament study in the scriptures. And so they took that to mean that they were safe. I mean, there was nothing really else to do. They were the people that God had picked for his own possession. In other words, even in their own minds, there was no real need for the heart to be involved in this. They again had their place. And so no genuine faith was required. I mean, that was unnecessary, right? I mean, if you've got the ticket into heaven, then you're safe. And we talked about that last time. They had the fire insurance. There was nothing else that they needed. They had signed the dotted line simply because they were Hebrew. And that was all that really mattered. In fact, it's really interesting as I did some studying here. Jewish tradition taught several interesting things about Abraham. And this is kind of gives us an idea how strongly they followed this. They said that it was Abraham who would enable even ships to pass by safely on the seashore. It wasn't just due to any kind of random situation, but it was because of Abraham that things were able to be out on the seas openly and, and to do what needed to be done there. It was Abraham who would send the rain to water the crops. So Abraham's a pretty important guy, right? If you're living in a place like Palestine and you need rain to water your crops, then talk to Abraham. It was Abraham, even they believed by tradition. Now, of course, this is all by tradition. This is not actual. This is not factual, biblically. But there was Moses. Abraham gave Moses the ability to receive the law and even to enter into heaven. He had to pass through Abraham. It's pretty strong. Moses is a pretty heavy hitter. They even believed that David's prayers were heard simply because of who Abraham was. Yeah, and then finally, Abraham, they believe, was the one who stood at the gate between heaven and hell and would turn back any Jew who happened to come that way because a Jew already had its, his ticket or her ticket into heaven, but nobody else could get there. And so if anybody was going to go to hell, the Jews believed it would be the Gentiles, the non-Jews. No Jew was going to go to hell. And that's why it was so alarming when Jesus brought up the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. It just was unthinkable. In fact, what's interesting here also is that some people believe this, and I can't quote this for sure, but some people believe that the Gentiles were people who were referred to by the Jews as dead stones. That was kind of a, a euphemism, if you will, to refer to uh, the people who were non-Jews. And so in verse 9, when John says, from these stones... God is able to raise up even children to Abraham. Again, if that's an accurate translation or interpretation, they would have said, really? Are you kidding me? These things, these people, these dead stones? Well, that could have been one interpretation, and I think personally that fits better in the context. But um, maybe that's not what he was referring to. Maybe he was referring to the river stones that, he was, that were in the Jordan River and, and saying something like, God is even able to raise up these material objects that have no life in them to be children. So in other words, don't profess to say that just because you are of the blood of Abraham that you've got your free ticket into heaven, which again is what they believe. So I guess, and at least I'm hoping that if you get the point, the Lord's saying who you are in this life, beloved, really means nothing. I think if we took any kind of principle from this at all, it would be that. That God is saying... All of your accomplishments, all that you do, all of who you are, where you come from, really means nothing. Now, it's important in its own right, in its own way, but that really has no bearing on anything spiritual unless your heart acknowledges who you really are in the core that is sinful. A person who is separated from the things of God and confesses the need for God to be able to fall on the face in a sense, and say, Lord, I need you to change me. I need you to make me who you want me to be. And really regenerate the heart. A life that lives by faith, trusting God for all things. Not just for the certain things, but for the daily breath of life. We've talked about this before, but I wonder how many times do we wake up in the morning as we fumble our way to the shower and say even things like, Lord, thank you for the breath.
breadth of this life that you've given me. You see how easy it is for us to take things for granted? When we talk about a changed heart, it's a heart that's sold out to God. I mean, literally just given over to the Lord and say, Lord, here is my soul. I'm giving to you everything that is precious to me and everything that has meaning to me. And I want to live for you each and every day. I hope you pay attention to the songs that Pastor Ham picks out for us because they're always filled with some meaning of depth that refer to the heart that's been changed. When we come to worship every Sunday morning, we're pouring our hearts out to say to the Lord, Lord, we acknowledge and understand that without you we're nothing. We have no ability to be righteous in your face or in your, in your eyes. And so John is trying to help them to see that and in turn we start to see these same things. And we need to live every day for him. And by the way, that's the good day, the bad days as well as the good days. I don't know about you, but I think we're pretty spoiled in this nation. And we really don't Comparatively speaking, to other nations in the world, we don't really have to work real hard. But we get pretty upset, right, when we don't have the coffee in the morning. <laughs> when the drive through line goes a little longer than we wanted to. Right, you know what I'm talking about? You see how easy it is for us to, to miss really what God has done for us. Well, Job said, and this went back in my mind this morning to something that we brought up before, but I thought it was appropriate. You remember the story of Job? Job is hammered, literally, by Satan, because God gives him permission to do so, and takes everything from Job, except his wife and servant, and basically that's it. Inflates him with all kinds of sicknesses, and even his body is oozing with sores, where he takes the pieces of broken pottery and he scrapes his body, and I guess that was some way to deal with it. His wife turns to him and said in verse 9, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? In other words, Job, are you kidding me? I mean, after all of this, our children are gone, our life is gone, our possessions are gone, and you're going to hold on to your integrity, your faith in God? Job, being a man of God, says to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. A great statement, though. But notice this, he said, Shall we accept good from God and not accept adversity? I mean, God, if God is truly all God, then everything comes from Him, even the bad days God allows into our life. Now, I'm not saying God is the author of sin. I'm not saying God is the author of what's bad. But I am saying that God will bring about or allow circumstances to occur by the hand of Satan in order to get us to realize we need Him. And we do need Him. And praise the Lord, He is a merciful, benevolent God, wanting to shower us his mercy and his blessings. And by the way, in Job's life, he had no idea what was going on behind the scenes. He didn't know what we know. We have the benefit of seeing behind the curtain of the text and understanding what was really happening there. We don't have, he didn't have that ability. And that's kind of where we are today. When something bad happens, we don't know what's going on behind the curtain. But we can say with faith, God, I know that you are a good God and I am to accept even the bad things as they come along in my life, even as well as I want to accept the good things. And so I hope we're understanding these basic facts about the Christian life. So let's, let's continue now as John gives a further indictment of these people in verse 10. He says, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees, guys. I mean, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and it's thrown into the fire. Listen, the, Phar the Pharisees and the Sadducees knew one thing. They knew that salvation was not without judgment. I mean, as much as they wanted the limelight on them, they also understood the scriptures being that there was going to be no salvation for anyone without the, heart, the life of the person being judged. They knew the prophecies better than anyone. Things like Isaiah 11, 4. Isaiah would say, with righteousness he will judge. He will judge the poor and decide with fairness, I love this about God, for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips and will slay the wicked. In other words, we don't have to repeat this over and over again, but let's just for our own sakes remind ourselves that there's coming a day where God is going to deal with the evil capacities of this world. Right now, he's not doing that, at least in our minds. But there's coming a day where he's going to take care of all. 
And so John says, hey, listen, check this out. The Messiah is here. The very one that the prophecies have foretold is here. They are being fulfilled even in him. And guess what? I know him. In fact, he's my cousin. We know that from history. And I'm telling you, he's already here to judge the ungodliness. And that's why I'm saying the axe is laid at the base of the tree. You can picture that in your mind. If you've ever watched someone fell a tree with an axe, or you've tried it yourself, it's the picture of the axe at the bottom of the tree, ready to chop this baby down. And John is saying, look, you don't have to wait on this. It's already happened. God's got your number. And what they didn't know was, they were on the top of God's list because of their hypocrisy. And God knew everything that was going on. In fact, they were going to be more, they were going to be judged more severely by God because they knew the truth. And we've talked about this many times before from Hebrews 10, 29. How much severe punishment do you think he, that's any person, will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? In other words, if you know the things about God that are true, and you know repentance is necessary, and you know that He is God, and He is the one who judges all things in mankind, and you reject Him, there is nothing that can be done except for there to be judgment. The writer of the Hebrews says, and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant. In other words, if you have basically said, yes, Lord, I know that you came to sacrifice your life for me to pay the debt of my sin as an act of grace and mercy, but I don't want anything to do with that. I don't want anything to do with you that God says, you've insulted the spirit of grace. You've basically said to God, I don't believe anything that you're saying is good enough. What an insult to the supreme God of the universe. The God who is the God over all gods. I mean, that'd be quite a switch, wouldn't it? Thinking you're okay. That everything's copacetic. And then you find out that you're the worst violator of sin against the Holy God. I mean, try to envision that in your mind for just a minute. Standing before the God of the universe and you think that you've lived a life that's worthy of somehow achieving life with Him in His kingdom. Only to find out that you've lived a life of hypocrisy and never really trusted Him as for who He is, the Lord and Savior. Later, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, we'll get to this in a couple chapters, Jesus makes this very clear. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. It's just not going to happen. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven may enter. What's the will of the Father? That is a repentant heart. Asking and begging for forgiveness. And God is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness, right? He says, many are going to say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we prophesy in your name? In other words, did we go to church every Sunday? I mean, did we live the kind of life that the community would say, oh, wow, look at how great he or she is? Did we do all the right things? And in your name, Lord, I mean, in Jesus' name, didn't we just live the life that we're supposed to live? And in the illustration here Jesus uses is even casting out demons. And in your name perform miracles. Folks, I don't know any of you or myself have done that kind of thing. The Lord's saying, no, these folks are going to think that their life is good enough. And then I'm going to say, look, get away from me. I never knew you. I didn't know you in your heart. You didn't know me in your heart. You are going through the rituals and through the motions. But you miss the whole point. Your heart needs to change. Now once John's finished with that conversation, it's a pretty lopsided conversation, John lays out his role for them to understand more clearly. And this is where we're going to get into a little bit of the different meat of the message here. He says, now as for me, look at verse 11. Here's what I do. My job is to baptize you with water for repentance. This is the sign. But he who is coming after me, talking about Jesus, is mightier than I am, and I'm not even fit to remove his sandals. Remember, John had said, when he said, well, he had said of John, the oh, Lord Jesus had said of John, that there was no one greater than John. He had been born to win. No one. But look at John's heart of humility. I'm not even worthy to bend over and unbuckle this. He is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. In other words, baptism, what John is 
Jesus said anything. It's not just a picture of this outward cleansing. Some people have taught that. There are churches today, beloved, that teach the same thing, that you're saved. And I've had people say this to me. When I ask them, how do you know that you're born again? They'll say, well, I was baptized at this point. Now, that's a right understanding, sort of. But it's not accurate biblically. Baptism does not save us. Baptism does not wash our sins away. To explain that fully more clearly here, baptism is simply a picture of a changed heart. That's what baptism is. I really want you to hear this this morning. It is an expression of the inner self that has been changed. It is a physical picture of the heart that is changed. But God knew that and them a part of his life. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, you see all this. But notice John says here, not only is he coming to baptize in that way, but he's coming to baptize by fire. Now, what does he really mean by that? Okay, we get the first part. He's coming to indwell us with his spirit. That was far different than it was in the earlier days before Jesus came. The Holy Spirit would at times come on people and move in their hearts. But Jesus said, when I come, I'm going to give to you the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is going to live in you. And now John says he's coming to do that, but part B of his coming is going to be to baptize by fire. And there's a lot of interpretation of what that means, but in the context, I think it very clearly speaks of divine justice. Because fire is used over and over again in Scripture to picture divine judgment. And so John's message is really, really simple here. If you guys want to follow God truly and be baptized for the right reasons, you need to change. Otherwise, you're going to be judged. That's the bottom line. And we said that this last time again. This is a horrible church growth message. And believe you me, I would love personally, to preach a message of just joy and peace, and you just go live your life any way you want it, and God will send it to I would love that. I would love to say, you know what, by the way, if you could just show up once a year, <laughs> just bring your checkbook, <laughs> on that day, I would love that. It would be so fun to just say, hey, go have a party, man. You know, God loves you. You don't need anything. You don't have to do anything. Everything's great. Just do whatever you want to do. And every now and then just say, God, would you kind of remember me and forgive me for that stuff? <laughs> and then just go on about your, your way. I'd love to be able to do that. But that's not what the scripture says. And John's not going to do that. Because eternal souls are at stake. And it might be that your eternal soul is at stake. This is a serious message. God says this can't just be an outward thing here. This can't just be on the surface. This has got to be a heart change. And I pray, beloved, if you're here as a true believer, you're constantly praying that God would open the hearts of unbelievers because they're going to plummet into the depths of eternal judgment and not even know it. I mean, as I'm standing here, I'm watching through the glass doors, cars just driving back and forth, and I'm not judging because people are busy and have things come up in their lives, but I'd be willing to bet if I were a betting man if we could somehow stop every car that's out here going by and ask them, do you know without the shadow of a doubt that God loves you and has come to rescue you and wants to pay the debt of your sin for you? Do you know that you have eternal life? I wonder what kind of response you get. That's not the message that people want to hear. But that's the message of the Bible. It's over and over and over and over. An expectation that we're being taught here. Very, very clear. The problem is, people want a God with no judgment. That's what they want. They want a God who's just full of mercy. I mean, mercy is awesome, right? You know when you do something wrong. I know when I do something wrong. And what we want is we want mercy. Mercy feels good when we 
does something to us. We love forgiveness. We love to be forgiven. Because it has this Holiness demands perfection. It has to. It's by default. His holiness demands retribution. There will be a debt that's paid. Like it or not. You can't get out of it. And that debt will be paid for anyone who's not perfect. I mean without sin. Well, guess what? Look around the room today. I mean you're perfect here. Praise his name, his judgment works in perfect harmony with his mercy. Think about it. His judgment, this is what people don't understand. God is a God of judgment, but he's a God of mercy. And they work hand in hand. It's beautiful. He's not out of balance. He's perfectly in balance. And he decides how to apply it. And we know this from passages like Romans 9. For he says, this is Paul writing, he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. It doesn't depend on you and me. The only thing that we can do is to say, Lord, we need your forgiveness. Please forgive us. And he is faithful and just to forgive us, like I mentioned just a moment ago. And both mercy and judgment are shown by the fact that the Messiah now, the King, is here according to John, excuse me, Matthew's Gospel. The whole point of what Matthew's laying out here is that the king is here as an act of mercy to sinners. That's why he's come. So the Hebrews, the Pharisees and the Sadducees would have seen the God of judgment. They would have understood that. But John's saying to them, yes, he is the God of judgment on you hypocrites because you won't acknowledge your sin and give your life to him. But by the very fact that he's come proves he is a God of mercy. He didn't have to come, right? But it proves that he is a God of mercy. So you need to repent. Be converted. That's an opportunity that we have. It's an act of mercy. God could easily say to each of us, no mercy, no patience, you're done. But he didn't. He came because he loves us. And he doesn't want us to fall under his judgment. No parent who truly loves their children, wants their child to fall under their discipline. Now, if you're really mad, you might. <laughs> but that's from our humanness, right? But God's not that way. God is not motivated by his emotion. God is motivated by righteousness and truth. And so he perfectly is in balance. So he came to call us to repentance and to prove to us that when we live a life that is converted, to him, we will produce fruit. And that fruit will be unto him, and we'll love him, and we'll show the world through his act of mercy. Look at this great God. I was a sinner lost in the depths of my sin, but he reached down who could have divinely judged me and didn't, and snatched me out of the pit and put my feet on the rock of Christ so that I can express to the world the glory of this gracious king. Now the recourse, recourse rather, the recoil of all of that is if you don't, if I were God saying this, if you don't accept what I'm offering you, I have no choice. Not in my judgment. And we learn as parents the same thing. Well, I know what the our culture is, but as parents who are doing their job, people walk into places and they're starting to shoot people because. They didn't have, now I'm not saying there isn't demonic work there, I believe 100%, you know that. But what I am saying is that there was an authority over that child at some place in their life that wasn't being the authority. Because God says, hey, you train them up in the way they should go, and what? They're not going to depart. In other words,
words, God will infuse into that soul the truth of himself, and they will remember that as they grow up under love and discipline and nurturing. But if they don't have that, they're going to live out their basic sinful instinct. That's what we're saying. It's not rocket science. You kick God out of everything, and you have a culture that goes to hell literally. And that's where we are. I mean, it's getting more and more frequent. Some of you are packing because you know that no matter where you go these days, you may have to defend yourself. Now, why are you doing that? Because you know this is reality. That's the world we're living in now. Well, how to get here? Just what I'm saying. Because parents stop disciplining. God is not a God who's going to stop disciplining. He is going to fulfill everything that he said he's going to do, and he's going to do it perfectly. Now, he may delay his judgment, but he won't delay it forever. It will come. In fact, look at verse 12. John says, hey, let me give you a picture here, boys, that you're going to get. His winnowing fork is in his hand. Now, you understand the winnowing process. We don't do that today, thank the Lord. God has shown us that mercy, but it was the idea of the farmer who would cast the grain up into the air with the big pitchfork and the chaff would blow away and the good stuff would fall to the ground. And Jesus is using that as a picture that they would have all understood in a farming community or that kind of life if you wanted bread and to say, look, you guys are like the chaff that's just going to blow away. That's the judgment part. Only the folks whose hearts are really converted are the ones who will enter into the kingdom of heaven. In fact, in Matthew 13, verse 40, Jesus says, Just as the tares are gathered up and burned with the fire, now the tares were just the, the worthless produce and weeds, and so it shall be at the end of the age. The Son of Man is going to send forth His angels. You want to know what the future is? I mean, we don't. We could put a sign up here and say, uh, Sister Rose, like used to be right down the road. Well, we don't need to do that. We parade the Bible because God's telling the world what He's going to do. Listen, I'm going to send forth the angels, and they're going to gather out of the kingdom all the stumbling blocks. Those who commit lawlessness, and they're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace, in a place where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 43, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, he who has ears of the hear. You know what the future's going to be? That's the future. God's going to gather it all together. He's going to make himself known. He's going to separate the good from the bad. And he's going to deal with the bad. And he's going to glorify himself through his own people. Boy, what a day that's going to be. I'm looking forward to that. So now just historically speaking, that sums up quite a bit here as we're looking at who Jesus is. If you go back with me just for a second to Matthew chapter 1, let me just make a statement here. Remember, Matthew's point is to display Jesus as the king. This is what the world needs, by the way. The world needs to hear the display of who Jesus is. So Matthew's doing that for the Jews. His ancestry proves it. The way he arrives approves it. <coughs> approves it. The fact that the Magi came from another land to worship him proves it. The fulfilled prophecies prove it in chapter 2. The baptism now that John is proclaiming that he is coming proves it, and now his own baptism proves it. So there's a little bit of a shift here, actually quite a dramatic shift, as we look into the next verse. Look at verse 13. Now Jesus arrived at this point from Galilee, at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. This word then in the text really represents a real turning point in Jesus' life, because for 30 years we don't know really much about Jesus at all. There's this period of three decades that nothing is known about him. All we do know is that he was living in Nazareth, growing up in the home of Joseph and Mary, with brothers and sisters, living basically a normal life from all that we know. But we also know that he was learning. This is what I want you to hear. He was learning. He was learning. You say, now wait a minute. Just stick with me. Listen to the text as it teaches us this. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. In other words, now, as God, he didn't need to learn anything. But as a man, he submitted himself to learn. And you're starting to ask yourself the question, why did he do that? Well, we're going to answer that question. As man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself, just like any human being so he would 
identify with every person on the planet as to what a human being is like. God come in the flesh to identify with human beings so that no man could say he's just God. He can't really say he understands who I am as a human being. The major portion of his coming was to pay the debt and also to affirm for all of us that he is truly human being as much as he is full God. And so he humbles himself. And we're told he experienced what we experienced. Just like we experienced. He experienced strategy. He experienced difficulty. Just like we experienced. But yet he never sinned. He never sinned because he was God. He was so thinking. If we for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are. Listen to that. He's been tempted. Jesus was tempted in every single way you and I are tempted. You say, well, we are every way. says this, if anyone, let's put Laurel Hill Baptist Church there, if anyone sitting in the pew on Sunday morning, September the 1st, at 11.34 in the, after, in the morning, wishes to follow me, or come after me, he must, or she must, deny him or herself. You know, deny yourself. He has this, take up your cross, and help me. That's what you have to do. But people will say, that is so hard to understand. No, it's really not. Get down. Follow me. Oh, and by the way, if you're going to really follow me, you've got to deny yourself. That's the hard part. We like ourselves too much. We like our lives too much. We like the way things are too much. We like being in control. We like being in charge. And Jesus says, you can't do that. I'm God. So you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross. Verse 25, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Listen, you give up your life, 
I am God, I love you, I'm going to care for you, I'm going to nurture you, I'm going to provide for you, I'm going to help you with the emotional strains in this life, I'm going to get you past the stumbling blocks and the roadblocks in your life, if you'll follow me, you deny yourself, and I will give you life, so giving you out the life that you see. So Jesus has given us the pattern here as well as all the other saints that have come before us who have left their lives of comfort. These beautiful examples suffer great cost financially and physically and emotionally understanding today that the price was well worth it. The price of eternity is worth it. Okay, so by this time now Jesus is about 30 years old and for whatever God's reasons were, this was the time that Jesus began his ministry. We could debate about what that was all about. We don't know. But the word arrived here gives us some inkling of understanding. If you do a word study on that, you understand that it is a word that was used to describe a public appearance. Jesus is making his public debut. If you want to put it this way, I guess you couldn't say the cameo appearance that was in the manger, but this was kind of the cameo appearance as an adult. He's coming in front of the camera. His official arrival is the one spot now. So on his own, nobody's pushing him, nobody's pulling him. He makes his appearance for his public ministry. And I want to emphasize that word public ministry. You realize, beloved, that there is no such thing as a private ministry. In other words, there's no such thing as a private believer. What you think about that? No such thing as a private believer. Now, I'm not talking about everybody has to be a preacher and a teacher and that kind of thing. That's not what I'm talking about. There are no hidden saints of God. There's nobody that God has called to be a hidden saint. You say, well, what about the people in China? What about the people that are persecuted? That's not what I'm talking about. Yes, there are people who keep things covered so that they can continue to promote what it means to be a believer, right? There are people who keep pages of the Bible hidden under grass and under huts, in order to pull it out in their Bible study so that the gospel will continue to spread. Dr. Falwell used to say this all the time, there are no spiritual hermits. God has not called anyone to be private in their lives. In fact, the psalmist said in Psalm 107, verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord, what? Say so. Say so. Well, who are they going to say so? To themselves? I mean, they're going to just crawl up in their own house at night and lock the door and say, so glad that I'm a believer. Did you know that you were a believer, Bruce? Well, I didn't know that. Thank you for telling me. Well, this is awesome. I love this great life, you see. No. God has said that we are to proclaim the redemption that the Lord has given to us. What redemption? Well, the psalmist says, redemption from the hand of the adversary. You realize this morning, beloved, we've been rescued, not just from God's judgment, but we've been rescued from the workings of Satan against us. Now, he throws his stones at us, but he can't have our souls, right? He can't have us. Oh, he tries. I was just talking to somebody this week who was kind of, I don't want to say complaining, but kind of, sort of, saying to me, well, it's my fault, and I can't give you the context, but... It's my fault because I prayed for patience. 
Now, that statement, I understand the, the, the fun and that kind of statement. You know, God tests us when we pray for certain things. But underneath that kind of statement is this. It's God's fault. Because I prayed for this and I got that. Right? That's what's really under that kind of statement. Oh, boy. We'll kind of joke with each other. Better not pray for that because God will put you in a situation where you need it. Right? But what we really should be saying is, Lord, I'm not afraid of what you're going to put me through because I know you have my best interest in heart. So I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask you for what I need because you know my heart. I don't know my heart. I know what I think I need. But I'm going to trust you for what you know I need. And we're not to be secret in any kind of way. It's, if we're going to continue life living obediently for the Lord, we've got to promote life openly. Again, God has not called us to live any other way. And there's other scriptures I could give you for all of that. All right, let's keep moving here just for a couple more minutes, and then we'll be done. So now when Jesus arrives at the Jordan, again, he's come publicly. But notice he's come alone. No friends or family. No disciples at this point. No one to depend on. Nobody to hide behind spiritually. That would be the tendency easily. Again, I suppose we could say that every person who's going to follow God must make that kind of decision at some point. You hear what I said? And I'm talking to my heart. At some point, beloved, we have to make a decision to follow God alone. We can't ride the coattails of anybody. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were riding a lot of coattails. They were riding Abraham's coattails all the way into the kingdom. Hoo hoo! What a water slide. What a ride. But Jesus is showing us here a very simple principle, which is listen, when we come to God, yes, we come acknowledging these things, but we have to come alone. There comes a time in every person's life where we have to do some business with God. We have to decide who it is that we're going to follow. We can't stand behind anybody else. We've got to do that alone. God is going to demand it. God is going to challenge us to do just that. He's going to ask us, who are you following? Is it you who's coming? Or are you coming because of who you belong to? Or where you grew up? Or because of what kind of position you have? Even if you're a teacher in the church. It doesn't matter. God's going to ask us the same thing. And we'll know. We'll know. And so Jesus comes on his public profession about 60 miles from Nazareth. That's a good walk. Most of us would want to do that. Not really sure where this event occurred on the Jordan River. We do know it was somewhere near Bethany. We know that John recognizes him. Remember, as I said earlier, they were cousins, so John would have known all this. I'm sure his mom, Elizabeth, talked to Mary more throughout the years that they're growing up. And so John would have known very well who Jesus was. It's a little unclear how well they knew each other personally. Because again, Jesus was 60 miles to the north and like that he was hopped in the car and driving to Richmond. You know, they didn't have that ability. And so, a little unclear about that. John, after all, was in the wilderness. Jesus was a city boy. Living in Nazareth. Making that up. <laughs> According to John the Apostle, John the Baptist really didn't seem to have a full awareness at this point that Jesus was in fact the Messiah until this event. Let me show you this in John chapter 1. He knew him as his cousin. He knew who he was going to be. But notice in John how he brings this out. Matthew doesn't say it this way. The next day he saw Jesus, that's John the Baptist, coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's a right statement. Then he, on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, John says. I didn't recognize him. But so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. So now what's happening there in John is something we'll see next time in Matthew as the dove descends. I believe up until that point, John was still beginning to question a little bit, or still questioning exactly was Jesus the one. We have some other passages in Scripture when he sends his own disciples to say, hey, ask Jesus, are you the one? 
And Jesus says, tell John, listen, the dead are raised from life. For the dead are raised back to life. The lame are healed. The blind see. And John will be affirmed. So John now, according to Matthew, and we know from, from John's gospel, John the Baptist will know that this new baby is Jesus. So this would be a wonderful reunion for these two. I mean, just a wonderful re reunion. But that wasn't the purpose. It wasn't for just fun times. It was because they were fulfilling a purpose. Notice in, back to Matthew chapter 3. Now. Verse 14. Jesus comes on the scene. He says, hey, John, how are you doing? I'm all done. So good to see you. I want you to baptize me. John goes, hold the phone. What? What? Notice what he says. John tried to prevent him. And that word prevent is, is like he continually kept saying to Jesus, no, 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 no. This is not how this works. I need you to baptize me. Because this was just so unthinkable for John. I mean, how could this happen? What do you mean, Jesus? You see, John understood that his baptism was for the repentance of people and to confess except that they were sinners, listen carefully, to turn from their sins. Think about John's baptism. John was saying to the crowd, you need to turn. You're sinners. You need to repent. And now Jesus comes to him and says, John, I want you to baptize me. Whoa! Of all the people on the planet, Jesus, you're not one of them. You're not a sinner. How am I going to baptize you? What are you asking me this for? It's an interesting question. So we have to ask the question ourselves. Is why did Jesus come for baptism? Well, the world would say, well, because he's a man and he needed salvation. He was a sinner just like everybody else. He needed forgiveness. And they came up with some real wrong reasons. In fact, they even wrote it down in one of the apocryphal letters. And we only have quotes from this one apocryphal letter. It's called the Gospel According to the Hebrews, interestingly where it goes like this. And this is quote, Behold, the mother of the Lord and his brethren said to him, that's John the Baptist, as John was baptizing for the remissions of sin, let us go and be baptized by him. But he, that's Jesus, said to them, What sin have I committed that I should go and be baptized by him, except perhaps this very thing that I have said in ignorance? In other words, Whomever put this together said, we're going to have to show you why Jesus needed to be baptized because he believes in himself that it's possible that he sinned in some way. You see how that destroys Jesus and his deity? But that's the problem with these false writings out there. They don't jive with what scripture really says. They don't align themselves properly. It's contradictory in other words. Now others will say, well, it was not until his baptism that Jesus took on his divine abilities. In other words, he really wasn't God until the dove floated down. And then miraculously, he became God. And everything was awesome. So he needed that to happen so that he could take on his deity. Again, but none of that aligns with Scripture. John was trying to stop Jesus because of just the opposite. Jesus was sinless, and he knew it. Like a, like, unlike all the rest of the people. Jesus was the only one who didn't need to do it again. John says, I have need to be baptized by you. And listen, that declaration by John was probably the most powerful declaration that anybody could ever make about who Jesus was. The greatest among men or people born to women said, you are the only one Never has it been said by anybody else in history that someone was both man and God come in the flesh and could take away sin. Baptism, beloved, is for sinners, not the Lord. So again, you ask, why then was he being baptized? Well, if he's not a sinner, what's he doing? He must have something else in mind. He does. Look at verse 15. Matthew chapter 3, permitted at this time, John. In other words, John, just go with me on this. For in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. What does that mean? I think Jesus is saying here, we need to 
to do this to fulfill everything that needs to happen. To prove who I am. And you say, what does that mean? Remember, baptism again, number one, is an example, first of all, of obedience to the Father. It's saying, Lord, I'm displaying myself as a true believer of who I say that you are and what you have done for me. You've come to take the place of my unrighteousness to pay the debt of my sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Very clear. He came to take on sin because He's the only one that could do that. Just understand, He didn't come because He was sinful. He came to take on sin. He came perfect. Isaiah 53 very clearly displays that. I won't take the time to read that to you, but you can mark that down. Isaiah 53. And listen, He didn't come just in this case for baptism, but in every way. Jesus was identifying Himself with sinners. I already said this earlier. Let's just reiterate this. He took on human flesh that was corrupted. Could we say that this morning, that our flesh is corrupted? Pastor Ant and I were just talking about it this morning. <clears throat> we're getting to the place in life where we've got to get up and move around more. Well, that's because we get old and stiff. Jesus took on flesh. He was born to a human mother who was corrupted. He lived with a sinful family. His brothers and sisters certainly weren't perfect. He lived among sinful people in his community. He suffered in a fleshly body that was corrupted by sin. Again, he grew older, as I said, from childhood to adult. But he himself was not sinful. So why was his baptism essential? To bring sinners to righteousness. His baptism, beloved, is far different from yours and mine. Your baptism and my baptism is displaying to the world that, Lord, we need you. His baptism was... You need me. You need me. I am the debt payer. And I'm going to show you through this that this is what is necessary. My life is to fulfill everything that is righteous. And by the way, John, if you don't do this, I will not be identified in all ways with all mankind. That's the problem. I will not be the identification to which John says, okay, I get it. I get it. And that's where we get verse 15, John permitted it. I got it. I see. And we need to see. We need to see that his baptism was not just a picture of his own righteousness to pay the debt of our sin, but we as God's people need to go through the act of baptism, the picture of baptism, to display to the world that we say this is truly God. I struggle so much, beloved, personally with people who want to follow Jesus, but they're afraid to get into baptism. There's nothing magical about that tank. There's nothing magical about that tank. It's water and wood and plastic. If we wanted to use the word magic, which we want to steer away from, the grace of God is in the heart that's changed by identifying with what Jesus has done when it's in the tank. Because as you've heard we've said many times before, and Paul says the same thing in Romans chapter 6, we are picturing the burial of Christ in the death of Himself and the resurrection of Christ as He was raised on the third day. And we are saying to the world, I believe that. My heart has changed. My mind has changed. And I want the world to know. So Jesus is saying to the rest of us, listen, I am man fully, I am God fully, and I've come to identify with you fully in all ways. You can never say that I've never been tempted the way that you have been. I've never experienced the pain that you've experienced. I've experienced it all, and I'm here to tell you that I've paid the debt. And you can trust me. And so, I think this would be a very fitting time for us to understand. And I can explain baptism a little bit more, but we won't go into that this morning. But simply say, listen, if you have never identified yourself through the waters of baptism, we need to talk. Because to sit here this morning and to say, I believe everything that you've said, but I don't really want to be baptized, that's a little embarrassing. Or for whatever the reason might be, is a wrong answer. It's a heart that says, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll deny myself. And I'll follow you. Because I believe in who you are. You get the point? You're saying, yeah, I got the point about 35 minutes ago. <laughs> 
Well, you know the reality that's really interesting to me? People will say that, but their life doesn't change. People will say, Pastor, if you could just give me that in about five minutes. Okay, I'll give you that in five minutes, but you change. I'll start cutting the messages down to three to four minutes if you start displaying a life that's changed. How about that? That's a good deal, right? When you start reaching out to your neighbors every day, and you start praising people in the streets, and you start giving people the gospel every minute of your life, then I'll start preaching three to four minutes, and I'll just say, hey, go get them. Reality is what people really want is to be done with the things of God because they don't really want this God. They just want to have this so they can get back to their normal life. I mean, I'm just telling the truth, right? That's just the truth. Because I feel it just like anybody else. We're truly changed people. Somebody said it to me this morning. I said, can you imagine what would happen through Laurel Hill Baptist Church if we were really, I mean really, serving God when we were supposed to serve. John said, hey, hey boys, you want to know how powerful God is? He could turn these rocks into people to save them if he wants to. Imagine what he could do with people whose hearts are really sold out to him and really doing what he wants them to do. Crazy, isn't it? So here's the question. Do you know you're born again? Do you know that Jesus has paid the debt of your sin? If you don't know that, Jesus says you need to give your heart to me, you need to repent, you need to trust me, and then you need to go fully through the act of baptism to show the world that you believe in your sin and who I am. Pretty good. Bottom line. And don't be afraid. If you want to be afraid of something, be afraid of my judgment, not the people who are out there watching you. That's a terrible church gross message, isn't it? <laughs> terrible. I mean, you know, you preach a message like that and people just run out of the door. Those are crazy. Especially that guy out It's not my message. It's not my message. It's not your message. It's the Lord's message. We just tell what he says, right? Okay, I'll be glad then. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for loving us. And I won't repeat everything in this prayer that we just said, but I pray that you would seal it to our hearts. But we thank you that when you save us, you do seal us. So you change our minds and you change our understanding. Lord, our heart at this church, you know this, our heart is to see other people come to know the joy of who you are. God of mercy and forgiveness and grace. Lord, we'll spend our hours running around this life like it's the most important thing we've got to do. And in reality, the most important thing we've got to do is make sure that we're okay for eternity. And remember, remember the conversation I was just having with somebody who told me that their dad had passed away and they just said, he's gone now. And we're believers. But what a sad tragedy. To have to look at a loved one like a father or a mother and just say when they die, oh well, they're just gone. They're just kind of vaporized out there somewhere. Lord, thank you that your word teaches us the opposite. That there's a place called heaven that you bring our souls to be a part of your work forever and ever and ever. A place of joy and peace and comfort. A place where you are the light of our hearts and we can just love each other. Lord, thank you that you teach us that we got to go through the door of forgiveness and repentance. And we're so thankful that you do. So, Lord, for any heart that you're reaching right now, I pray that you do your work and prove to them that you are God. And Lord, we'll just praise you. So we ask all of this in Jesus' name.